everything is going good, everything is under control. And if it's not under control, well, then hopefully, you know, God's in control of that situation, even though we feel like it's out of control of our own hands, out of our own hands. So this morning, we're going to continue in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is where we are at today as a ministry, as a church, and as a people. Why? Because maybe God is saying to get our act together. Maybe God is saying to get our act straight, but we don't know the reason why. But the book of Acts is portraying where we are at today and where we should be going from this, from, from this point going forward. Because I know we all have a lot of questions this morning, and if we don't, well, maybe God had answered them for you. But we always want to know what's, gonna, what's the next thing that's going to happen. What's the next thing that's going to take place? Because I'm just left out in the dark, uncertain of what's going to transpire for this following week. And so we're going to go into Acts chapter 5. And I entitled this message, Me, Myself, and I Am. Me, Myself, and I Am. Acts chapter 5, going to verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? Father, this morning, Lord, I just ask, God, that you open up our hearts, open up our minds, Lord. Help us to receive this word, God. Help us, Lord, to apply it to our lives, apply it to our hearts, Lord. And this morning, let there be clarity and understanding, God, in your word. Help us, God. Guide us, God, in the direction, God, that you want us to go this morning. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So here Peter is. He's talking to Ananias. They, here they did. They brought an offering to the apostles because they sold a piece of land. And what they were doing at this time is they're laying it out. And they're saying, here is the money that we made from this land. So in their minds and in their, their own hearts and their, their intentions, from what they sold, they were surrendering it. They were giving it all. They're saying, here you go, here's everything, here's all the proceeds, and this is for you, for whatever work that God wants to do. So here they are, both the husband and the wife, and they kept back part of the proceeds, and both, and his wife was also aware of it, and they only brought a certain part and laid it at their feet. And Peter replied with saying, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to a lie? to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. Pretending to have given it all away when they only have given a part. They were being deceiving, yet they were also playing a part. And this happens in our hearts. This happens in our walks. This happens... In different parts of our lives, it's where we tell God, I'm giving it you all. I'm giving it all to you. We tell God that we're surrendering everything to him. And we're just saying, Lord, here it is right here. Everything that I told you that I was going to do, everything that I promised I was going to do, here it is. I'm laying it before your feet. And then we deceive ourselves, thinking that we're giving it all. But yet, we're only giving partiality. We're given a part. We're given a piece. Not even the whole kit and caboodle. We're not giving it all to God, but we're just giving just a little bit to feel as if we're doing good. To feel as if we're doing something great and powerful. But they were doing this out of the wrong intentions. And verse 4 continues to say, While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. 
You have conceived this in your own heart, meaning you have purposed it. This is what you decided to do. It was his control. He could have been honest. This is what I have, and but this is what I'm giving. He had control. He had possession of it. It was his choice on how he was going to present it. And we have to be careful that we don't get caught up in the same trap, that same mentality. Letting things take place, acting as if we're doing nothing wrong. And in actuality, we are, and doing nothing about it. This is the easy thing to do, is to say that we're doing everything right, but then we know we're missing some stuff, we're missing some steps, and we're not fully doing it, but in our own hearts and our own minds, we found peace in it. We want to say it's okay because I'm doing my best when you know that you're only doing partiality. We can lay out everything as if we're surrendering to God, but we can't fool God himself. And this is an important place that we don't want to catch ourselves being in. Being honest with ourselves and being honest with God. This is the most important thing, being honest with ourselves. Look, Lord, this is who I am. This is what I can be. This is what I am most of the time. 20% of the time I'm this. 70% 70 of the time I'm that. And 10% I'm something else. We have to recognize who we are. Being honest to God and coming before him saying, look, Lord, you're asking this of me, but I'm not ready for surrendering to this part, but I'm ready for this. And letting him work out in the area that he needs to work out in. Because if we, if we play it and we fake the funk and we're saying, Lord, I'm giving it all to you. I surrender. That's just it. But we're, in reality, we're holding on to things in our hearts. Then that means we're not truly letting go. That means God is only allowed to do so much work in you because you haven't let it go. You haven't been honest with God. We're not honest with God all the time because sometimes we just want to feel good. Sometimes we want to feel like as if we're doing everything good, but in reality, we know that we're kind of like pushing some stuff off to the side. And we don't like that feeling. We don't like that feeling of, man, that's sacrifice and that's work. I have to give that up. And that's what makes it hard. That's what makes it hard, especially when it's in front of people, just like Ananias and his wife. They did it. They did it in front of the church so that they can look good, so that they can get the praise and they could be like, oh, my gosh, that was such a great deed that you did. And that they can get all the credit for the work that they were doing. In reality, they weren't. We have to continue to learn on how we need to be honest with ourselves and with God. Because not all there's times in our lives we're like, okay, everything's good. I'm doing fantastic. God is moving. But when you go home, when we go home, we're just kind of like, man, ain't nothing going right. All things are going bad. But everyone else thinks I'm okay. But I'm not fooling God. But yet, we can't be looking for recognition from others. We have to be looking into God, saying, Lord, this is me. Here I am. And do a work in me. I don't want to pretend anymore. I don't want to act like as if I have it all together. I don't want to act as if I'm good. Because that means we're refusing the help. We refuse what's good for us because we know when we admit to God, God's right in there. He's, he's like, okay, I see that. I'm going to go right in there. I'm going to go do that work right now. Why? Because you're being honest with me. Why? Because you're being open with me. And because of that, I'm going to do something in you now because it's coming from the heart. And going on verse 5, it says, then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. 
So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. Ananias heard what Peter had to say, and that was just it. He just went down, hit the floor. He took his last breath. That was it. Knock out. And the young men, in verse 6, and the young men arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. Not only did greed consume him, but he was trying to play the part. And it was God, it wasn't Peter that had did this to him. He was trying to pull a fast one on God, but God called him out on it. God called him out on it. And it's been months and it's been years and sometimes even longer than that, that God is calling us out. God is calling us to be faithful. God is calling us to be true. And just like Ananias, he had a choice. He had a choice to be honest in the first place. He had a choice to do what was right. And for years and months, maybe God has been dealing with us on a personal level, dealing with us on certain subjects in our life. Dealing, on, dealing with us on things that we need to stop to do, stop doing. He's saying, this is no good for you. You need to stop it. What is God dealing with us today? Because today isn't a normal day. Today we're having church in a, in a time of pandemic. In a time of when things are chaotic and things are going wild and everything that the media wants to portray. And while all this is happening, I know God is speaking to us. I know God is speaking to hearts. He's, he's, he's doing something. But what is God challenging you in today? What are we saying yes to today? What are we coming back and saying, Lord, I will come back to you when I think about it. And I will come back to you when, with an answer. But yet, a month has already passed by. A year already has passed by. Years have passed by and still yet, we haven't been honest. And God is dealing with us today. He's dealing with us in the way we are. In the, dealing with us in the way that we should be. Going in verse 7, it says, Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. So Ananias' wife, she came in. An opportunity for her arose. She didn't know it. To come clean. She didn't know what happened to her husband. If she knew what happened to her husband, I'm pretty sure she would have seen Peter in there. And she would have walked right back out that door and walked out the other way and left town. She would have headed out if she knew what had taken place to her husband. But here she is, not knowingly. She goes right in. The first thing that Peter asks her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. Tell me, are you being honest with me? If she was aware of what had taken place, I'm pretty sure she would have changed her mind. She would have said, oh, this is what happened, Peter. Uh, my husband did it. Maybe the blame would have shifted. He convinced me to do it. He gave me a mean look to do it. He said mean words to me to do it. He used his words of manipulation to make me do it. He used his masculinity to make me do it. He used everything in his book to persuade me to do it. I listened to him because I thought it was right. Because I thought I was doing the right thing. In verse 9 it says, And Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead and carried her out, buried her by her husband. Peter gave her an opportunity to come clean. 
Peter asked her, if someone asks you a question, if God comes and asks you, and he deals with you, and he said, and you tell God, yes, Lord, I'm doing what you asked me to. I'm listening to everything you told me to, and I'm being obedient in this area that you have been dealing with me in. And the next day later, the week later, he asks the same question. I would want to go back and kind of figure out, okay, am I really being faithful to what he's been telling me because he's asking me again? If he's asking me again, there's, I'm missing a step somewhere. Or I'm not being honest with myself, let alone honest with God. And sometimes God comes to us in dreams. God comes to us in visions. God comes to us even when we're here in church all the time. And then he deals with that and he asks us the same questions over and over. And we go and we look at God. God, why are you, why are you bugging me? Why are you annoying me with the same question? I already told you yes to begin with. I've been agreeing with this for the past year. But God has been saying to let go of certain things, and yet we haven't let go. We haven't tasted the full growth that he, he wants us to take place to. What is that word? To experience. Because the more that we serve God, the more that we fear God, the more that we obey God, we experience him that much more. And so when God comes into you in a dream and he's dealing with you, it makes it that much more simple to say, yes, Lord, but help me in my weaknesses. Yes, Lord, but help me in my disbelief. Yes, Lord, but help me because I have health issues. And being out here right now, it's not good for me, but yes, Lord, I will do it. Re doesn't matter my health issues. It doesn't matter what else is going on in my life. It doesn't matter what my fears are. It doesn't matter what my opinions are. Why, God? Because you are asking me and you are in control. And that is just it. And why? Because the experiences that I've had with you all these years, I trust you and only you. So help me, God. But here is his wife. And she is following the footsteps of her husband. Listening to what they had agreed on. They both came into agreement, even though it was the wrong thing. Peter came and asked her, is this correct? And here she is because she decided not to follow God, but to follow her husband, her spouse, her significant other. Decided to follow someone else that they, she suffered the same thing that her husband, who was also disobedient, suffered the same consequence suffer the same thing. And we have to remind ourselves, who are we listening to today? This isn't just about husbands and wives today. This is about who are we listening to? Who are we taking air to? Are we taking air to God? Or are we taking air to what we listen to? Are we taking air to the TV shows that we watch, the fantasies that are out there? What are we giving our ear out to? Because whatever we're listening to, our heart takes in. Our heart wants to develop it and our heart wants to put it out. Why? Because it sounds so good. Because when God deals with this, it don't sound good all the time. It doesn't sound good. We want to cry sometimes. We want to throw fits all the time. Why? Because God, you just challenged me last week. I need a break. But when God is wanting to do something in your life, there's no times for break. When there's something about to take place in your life, there's no time for breaks. When there's a breakthrough around the corner, there's no time for break. There's no time for a timeout, Lord. I need a timeout. I need a one-month timeout, please, because I am growing weary. He says, bring your burden to me, all those who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That scripture isn't there for nothing. He doesn't say it because it's part of home, but he says it because it's his truth. It is in our flesh to get tired. It is in our flesh to fight. It is in our flesh to want to give up. But it's the spirit of God that keeps us moving. It's the spirit of God that keeps us flowing, that keeps us going. And for some reason, even though we get so tired, we don't want to stop. 
We just want to keep going and say, man, Lord, I am so tired, but I am just feeling so crazy right now because I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, and whatever it is that you want me to do, I'm going. Let's go. The virus, what about the virus, Lord? You're with me. Let's go. If you're with me, who can be against me? Let's go. Lord, you're already speaking to the president. And he's listening. And he's saying, let the churches be open. Saved or unsaved, there are those that will listen to God because they know that it's right. Because there's a God-given fear somewhere in there. Just because there is an agreement between Ananias and his wife didn't mean that it was right. It didn't mean that it was right. Just because we may agree on something, if it is not in God's will, does not mean that it is right. God will always find us out on the things that we try to get away with. He will always find us out. We all have choices to make. Every day we have a choice to make. This morning we had a choice to make. Do I want to go to church and risk it? Or do I want to go to church because I want to hear from God? I want to be around the people of God. I want to hear something encouraging from God. What was the choice that we made here this morning? What was the choices, the choices that we have been making Or do I want to fit in with everyone else and watch cartoons, eat some popcorn, watch a movie when I know that I should be doing God's will? In my heart saying that it's not time, but with God saying it is time. Finding all circumstances and situations taking place today it will be very easy in our hearts to say, you know what? It really is not a good time. It really is not a good time because there's a lot of people that are sick out there. There's a lot of people that are dying out there. Yeah, but there's a lot of people that are still hurting out there. Yeah, there's a lot of people that are still seeking God out there. There's a lot of people that are still hungry out there. There's a lot of people that are looking for God but cannot find them. Why? Because pastors have been taking the easy way out. They've been taking the easy way out. We have to know and who we are listening to. Who are we listening to? Who's influencing us to do the changes in our lives? Because if it's God that's doing it, then God is with you all the way. He's not going to stop midway in your trucks and say, you know what? I need a timeout because I'm tired now. No, God's like, all right, let's keep going. Let's keep going. All right, let's wait right here. Because what I have in store for you, I need you to grow right here for right now. God has everything planned out perfectly, even during a time of this. Why? Because it's in God's plan. This didn't catch God by surprise. This is a time that God is doing the background work. And he's deep in our hearts. He's in our homes. He's in our relationships. He's doing much more than we ever thought or even imagined that he ever can do. Going forward in verse 12, it says, I'm sorry, I'm finished verse 11. It says, so great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. Imagine if we were here. And something happened to take place, and everyone was a witness to it. That would strike some fear into me. Like, oh, man, I don't want none of that. Someone <laughs> move that away. I don't want nothing to deal with that. That would strike fear into me. That would change the mentality of me, of my heart. Whoa, whoa, hey. Hope I'm not the next one question. Hope I get it right. And I'm not just fooling myself the whole time and answer what I feel. Verse 12, it says, And through the hands of the apostles, 
Many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Here we go again, all in one accord. We're not getting away from that. We're not getting away from that. All in one accord, all together, all believing the same thing, all the same mentality, the same mindset. And they were all in one accord in Solomon's porch. This is where they did teaching. This is where Jesus was at at one point. This is where they had their studies at. This is where they taught. This is where they spoke. So they all gathered here, and this is where they all went, all together. Why? Because they came together wanting to hear what they all had in common. They wanted to hear the word. The word that brings life in what they were charged into doing. It says in verse 13, yet none of the rest dared to join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. It says, I found that kind of funny. It's in verse 13, it says, yet none of the rest dared join them. But the people esteemed them highly. Man, it was probably those that seen what had happened and probably didn't want to get called out. Probably didn't want nothing bad to happen to them. It doesn't say why, but it says that they did not dare to join them. Because there are some that want to hear God's word and they're willing to go and receive what it is that God wants for them. And there are those that want God's word, but yet, I'll take so much of it. I have respect for you. I have high regard for you. And what you're doing is good, and I love God. But I'm going to step back over here while you go do your God thing, because this is where I'm comfortable at. And I won't allow myself to go so far because of maybe my insecurities, because of my shortcomings, because of whatever it is that we want to put ahead of God. And sometimes we only want to involve ourselves so much because we feel like in our hearts we only could give so much because inside we know that we haven't let go. It's hard to go out there and do an outreach. It's hard to go out there and preach and give your testimony and tell people the things of God that he's doing in you or that he's done, that he's spoken on you, if you haven't yet done it yourself. It's hard to go and do that because people can see right through you. People are sneaky out there. People can read through you. People are getting scared of being called out. We wouldn't have to be scared of being called out if we were doing the right thing. If we're doing the right thing. Does the right thing hurt? It does. Why? Why does it hurt? Because you have to offend people. That means you have to do the right things. You have to tell them the truth. And what hurts is when they reject it. And when they turn around and they talk bad about you. Does doing the truth hurt? Yes, it does. Because God's not into feelings. He's into the truth. If your feelings get hurt because God's dealing with you, well, deal with it. (laughs) There's no way you can get away from it. You can't go crying to anyone else. They're not going to do that for you. If they're a real believer and they fear God, they're going to say, I ain't praying for you. Why? Because now you're going to interfere with God. But I'm going to pray for you so that you understand. I'm going to pray for you that you receive it. I'm going to pray for you so that you take it in so that it can bring change to you. And there they go again, hurt because you told them the truth. But yet God chases them down. God's love chases us down. Even though I was a foe. God's love still chased me. 
in that one song that we sang. Hopefully I said that correctly in the English version. The song that we came to me, and even though I was so undeserving, you still loved me. And here I am today, I don't know how, by the grace of God, I am still breathing. By the grace of God, I still have a voice that I can talk. By the grace of God, I am still here today, being able to be a voice for you, God. We can now say we never know even more what's going to happen tomorrow. What laws are going to change tomorrow? What things are going to transpire next week? How much more they may try to hold us down? How much more they might try to quiet us down? But how much more God is still even more with us? Look, our God does not know defeat. He only knows victory. We know defeat. We know defeat quite well. We knew that up to the day we met Christ. The day before we met God, our life was nothing but defeat. Even though up here we thought we were winning, we never had salvation. We had eternity, all right, but it wasn't for heaven. But God gave us opportunity. God still loved us. And even today, when we're fighting God, even today, when we're trying to compromise with God, even today, when we want to keep pushing God off, he's still pursuing us. He's still loving us the same. He's still with us fighting our battles. He's still with us because he knows it's in our heart. To surrender it to him. And we can thank God today for our health. We could thank God today for our circumstances. We could thank God today for our trials. We could thank God today for everything that has taken place in our lives. Everything that has taken place in our lives. Because if it wasn't for any of that it wouldn't have drawn us closer to him. If life was so good, we wouldn't be here. But because of all the chaos, all the headaches, all the trials, the depressions, the anxieties, you name it, and you got it. And some of us still may have it, but God's still going to deal with that. That's what draws us closer to God. That's what makes us give us our fight. That's what gives us our moxie and saying, you know what, Lord, I'm not going to give up because it's too good to give up. I feel good because of you. I feel inspired because you're just speaking to me. I feel loved. Why? Because I'm still alive today. I feel Like I'm on top of the world, even though everything around me is in chaos. Why? Because the true love of God in our hearts today is more satisfying than a garden of soda tacos. More satisfying than the hamburgers, the steak hamburgers. More satisfying than... The trout that you have seasoned with lemon and cilantro. More precious. God's love is more precious than this temporary thing that we have in front of us from day to day. That brings satisfaction even in the midst of all trials. Even in the midst of, I don't know if I'm going to make it through this. God's love always pulls us through. And it's at this time in our lives we have to realize that it's God's love is why we're here today. It's God's love and why we're feeling the way that we're feeling. I know God has been putting a lot of fight in your hearts. I know God has been speaking to your hearts and there's been a lot of stirring up. It's been evident. And we, and we can't stop to think that this is just the beginning, that this is all towards the middle of it. This is just the beginning. This is what God is preparing us to do as a church and as a ministry because he has big plans in store for us. 
Well, God keeps dealing with me because I don't want to get over it. He wants you to get over it because there's something not too far ahead that he really needs you for. Oh, well, he has other people. Yeah, but he wants you. Yeah, he has other people, but he wants you. He's dealing with you. Heck, he's dealing with someone else to deal with you. <laughs> and you're saying, I don't get the message yet, Lord, and he sent someone else. <laughs> and then we get annoyed because we keep being told the same thing, not by God, not by the pastor, not by the message, not by the dreams, not by brother so-and-so, not by sister so-and-so, not by brother so-and-so, but they keep coming and coming and they won't stop. Well, maybe you've been asking God to speak to you, and he's using everything that he can. And right now, there's probably a donkey 100 miles away going, hee-haw, hee-haw. Why do I have to walk all the way from here to there, Lord? Is he really going to believe me? You sent everyone else to him. So here comes another messenger coming to speak to you. When is it the time that we're going to be willing to accept it and say, man, that was true? Because once we accept it, there's a breakthrough. There's a breakthrough, man. There's a breakthrough that is just so unexplainable. So unexplainable. And it says in verse 14, getting ready to close, and the believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick and out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. They were all healed. Hint, hint, God is getting ready to do something. God is getting ready to do something in you. In you. Well, I don't have much to offer, but what you do have to offer, he wants to use it in you. Well, it doesn't matter what I have because it's not that great. It doesn't matter in your eyes. In God's eyes, it's perfect for his plan. In God's eyes, he gave it to you, not for you to withhold, but for you to give out. Because there's going to be a time when the church is open and all these pastors are going to come out. There's going to be all this fresh revelation, all these things going on, all these gatherings taking place. And God is going to say, now go out. You're now prepared for this. Now go out and now believe with even more. Now go out and have faith. Why? Because now you have the fight in you. And, but, and remember this. It is not only you that is doing it, but it is, it is me through you. I'm doing the work, not you. I'm doing the miracles, not you. I'm sending you out. Why? Because I need those that are going to be brave, those that are going to step out, those that are going to have faith. And go out there and be the ones to go and speak the truth. Why? Because I am with you. I am with you. And that is where he's taking us. And that where he's gonna, that's where he's going to take us. There's no doubt about it. Be ready. Be ready. Amen.